All right, so welcome first off to our first installment of our new series. We are starting a new series today that's going to run for several weeks. It's called Reset. Jesus changes everything. Reset. Jesus changes everything. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be experiencing this promise, the promise that we can be reset. No matter what's going on in our lives, whatever is not functioning well, we can actually reset it with Jesus. Now to reset something, when we think about this, is actually to get it back to its original design, to its original intent, to its original purpose, right? It's literally to set again. So if you play piano here and you want to play the note C, you know that if it doesn't sound like a C, what do you got to do? You got to get your piano retuned, right? You reset it. How about phones? Anybody ever had trouble with your phone being sluggish and maybe too tired that doesn't actually do what, it wa what you wanted to do? Not long ago, I was taking pictures with my cell phone, and every time I took a picture, it turned it upside down. And I couldn't figure out how to get it back around. I handed it to my 22-year-old son. I'm not that illiterate, though, technology, I will say that. But I'm like, can you figure it out? I can't. And he was like, I don't know. And he just turns it off, turns it back on, and then it worked again. So what do we need? Every now and then, our phones need to be shut down and be rebooted. They need to be reset. Marriages are the same way. What about in our marriages when we go through these series of irritable moments or misunderstandings? They need to have effective communication, right? We need to have that quality time. We need to be reset. When the team that you're working with at your job, maybe you work with others and you just haven't been reaching the, the quoted numbers that you're supposed to reach. Maybe you haven't been taking care of the clients like the way you're supposed to be taking care of them. And what needs to happen? Your team needs to come back together, needs to get reset, get recreative, uh, certainly has some fresh ideas, but new incentives maybe, whatever it is, but the team needs to be reset. I got a good one for you. What about when you realize it's summertime and you've been eating tons of hot dogs and ice cream? Ice cream's my weakness, right? And before you know it, you've put on a couple of pounds. Did you, did you like ice cream too? Me too. It's my favorite, right? What, what flavor? Yes. Uh, vanilla. Vanilla? Mom says vanilla. What do you say? Chocolate. And, um. He's got more than one. <laughs> oh, very good. Ice cream is good, but what happens when we realize, I'm not even at the end of summer yet, you put on a couple pounds because you're eating too much ice cream and too many hot dogs and all that good summer food, right? You got to kind of reset your diet, right? Get back in a routine. Put some greens in your diet, for goodness sake, right? We got to keep eating the greens, right? <laughs> Mint chocolate chip, I like that. Well, I can't say I like that one anymore. I can't have the chocolate, but all is good. But we can all relate to these types of resets, right? These common everyday needs, these have connections. They're, they're re excuse me, the connections are need reestablished. Our systems need restructured. Our routines need reimagined. We all know how powerful and life-changing these kind of situations can be when we reset these and when we restart. But we may not be so quick to realize that there's something else that needs restarted. A lot of times in our life, it's the external things that need restarted, like our diets, like our marriages, those kinds of things. But there's also an internal working that needs a reset, that often needs a reset that is so deep that maybe we don't even realize it. Maybe we keep living our life, we're just doing all the things, we're busy, we're distracted. But there are times when not just the externals need reset, but the internals need reset. There are times that when what we need more than anything else is a total, complete, full reset of the soul. So we're going to spend the next few weeks working through four key resets that promise to reinvigorate the core of who we are, to get us back to the purpose of why we are here, to who we are actually supposed to be. And these resets are actually four one-liner prayers. So real simple. My hope is that you'll remember these four key words over the next four weeks and you'll be able to use this in your own personal life. So they go like this. Jesus reset my heart. That's the one we're going to be talking about today. Jesus reset my heart. This is the resetting of our faith where all other resets begin. This is the first one we have to do. Get our heart reset with Jesus. So next week we're going to talk about the second one. Jesus reset my mind reset my mind. This is resetting of our thoughts, the center of our belief. Now, I'm not going to be here next week, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be here next week. I'm going to be with the young adults. We're going on a trip. But one way or another, you all come. We're going to be doing our church, but you do your church here. And Jane is going to be giving you the message about how to reset your mind. Then the next week, we're going to talk about reset my voice. 
All right, that might sound strange. How do you reset your voice? But this one is about resetting our words. What we say, what we shouldn't say, what opportunities we should take when we're actually have the opportunity to be talking about God with somebody. That's going to be the key when we're really looking at. And the last week is reset my hands. Reset my hands. The resetting of our work, our motivations to do that work, and even the mechanics to get it done. So this is all based on a natural progression uh, to these four different categories of being reset. But the part that unifies them all is we were made for something so much more than the anxiety, than the angst in our world. We were made for so much more than the heavy challenges that we all carry, the exhausting, the frustrating experiences that too many of us are enduring today. And that something more is Jesus Christ. And I think we all, especially in the summertime when we get really busy, we need to recheck and reset and refocus ourselves on Jesus Christ. So that's the key of what we're going to be doing here. Now for this idea of Jesus reset my heart, we're going to look at Psalm 24 today. It's actually partly in your bulletin. I didn't print the whole thing in there because this is the part we're really going to be focusing on. But before I get into just that part, let me go ahead and read the whole thing to you so that you get a better idea of what's going on here in this psalm. Now remember, psalms a lot of times were poems or they were actually songs that were to be sung. So think about that as I read this to you. <coughs> the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up. Lift up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. Now, again, imagine this as a song, all right? And so really what was happening in this song, I'm sure it was probably set to some type of music, but it was likely done in a corporate worship where a bunch of people were together. There could have been people standing outside the temple and people standing inside the temple. So the people outside would have been shouting this and singing this to open up the temple gates. Let the presence of the Lord out. Let the presence of the Lord be right here among us. Open up the, the temple gates. And from the inside, maybe it was the priest or maybe it was some other group of people. They would have been saying, who is the king of glory? Who is the king of glory? Outside. Those people in unison would have said, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, proclaiming how strong, how powerful he really is. So this exchange would have went back and forth, and that's why in the song we read it twice here, and it's repeated. And then the temple gates would have swung open, and all of a sudden it would have been like, the Lord is here. The Lord is here, and the Lord's presence is with us. Now David is the author of this psalm, as he's the author of many of the psalms, but not all of them. But most scholars believe that he wrote it as a song to commemorate the occasion of his bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into the place that he prepared it for. So we can read a little bit about this in 2 Samuel. It says, They brought the Ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the special tent David had prepared for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. When he had finished his sacrifices, David blessed the people in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. So now the ark here, let me give you a little history of what this thing is. It had been built 400 years before this turn of events. It was built by Moses on God's request. Basically, God said in Exodus 31, Moses, I want you to take these two artisans. He already had them selected, already had them picked out. And he said, I want you to use these guys. These guys are going to build the ark. The ark, by the way, is not a boat, not like Noah's boat. All right. We're not going there. This is actually a box, believe it or not. All right. So it's just a simple box. But that would house the second set of the tablets that held the Ten Commandments. If you remember, Moses is human, uh, just like you and I. <laughs> he held the first tablets. He got mad. And what did he do with them? He smashed them down. He threw them down and broke them. So God gave him a second set, right? God is a forgiving and loving God, so he gave him a second set. But in this box were those two tablets as well as some other holy artifacts. 
So the Ark, if you would, if you can imagine it here, it's a wooden box made with this um, acacia wood, it's called. It's a very beautiful wood. It has some gold around it. It's made absolutely gorgeous because this was the Ark of the Covenant, of God's covenant, and because the building of it had been commissioned by God himself, it was far more than just a wooden box. The Ark of the Covenant represents God's solemn pledge to his people that if they would obey his laws, if they would obey his commands, then he would bless them all the days of their lives in a very mighty way. Now, let's not forget, though, that the opposite is true. So if, what happens if you don't obey the laws? What happens if you don't obey God when he tells you to do something, right? There's going to be consequences. There's going to be these natural consequences that certainly come around um, that happen whenever we ourselves decide that we are going to live outside of God's protection. We're going to live outside of God's provision. So like so many of us sitting here today, the Israelites would learn this the hard way. So here's what we have so far. David is returning the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem to a special place that he had prepared for it. And as he brings it back to its rightful place, he's singing this song from Psalm 24. He's singing a song to God about how God is so good, about God is so powerful, that he's created the whole earth, he's done everything within it. He's talking about the importance of having clean hands and a pure heart before God, and about the foolishness of trusting anything other than God. And while all this seems good and well on the surface, there is a world-rocking takeaway for us that I think we can only discover if we look a little further at the scripture that's printed inside your bulletins. You see, the Israelites, they were enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years, and they got out by crossing the Red Sea, and God made this miraculous escape for them to be out, and they, they settled in at Mount Sinai, where their leader Modus, Moses received those Ten Commandments from God, and soon after that, the Ark of the Covenant was constructed to keep them in, and as the Israelites continued their journey through the Mount Sinai and around, the Ark of the Covenant actually led the way, actually was the path. Joshua 3 describes it like this. He says, early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove, which is the name of the wood that the box was made out of, so you can imagine what this grove looked like, and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp, giving these instructions to the people. Now, I'm going to ask you to listen closely because that's exactly what I'm sure these, these priests did and said, I said officers, didn't I? I did that when I was preparing, too. Don't ask me how I did that. But when you see the Levitical priest, he says, these guys are going to, uh, it is officer, I apologize. Uh, they're going to give you these instructions. They say, when you see the Levitical priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Stay about a half mile behind them, keeping clear distance between you and the Ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. Then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. So the Ark of the Covenant literally led their way, all right? So this was put in the front of the group as they were wandering around, and they wandered around a little bit, I'll say. In fact, a little bit was about 40 years long that they wandered in the desert because this group of people decided that they weren't actually going to obey God. They weren't going to listen to his commands. They didn't completely trust him and believe in him. They didn't have that faith in him. So God says, all right, fine. <laughs> I'm going to wait. <laughs> You're going to wait. You're going to wander around in the desert here for 40 years, until you all die off and then the next generation your children hopefully they'll be a little bit more faithful I'll let them inherit this beautiful promised land that I was going to give to you now before during and after those years in the desert really since the very beginning of the time Israelites and this group of people called the Philistines they did not get along. <laughs> they were bitter revivals. They wanted to literally destroy each other. That was their main goal, just destroy them and get rid of them. They would face off in major battles seven times in the scriptures, seven times. One of the most famous ones that you all probably know very well is the story of David when he was a young boy who flung the stone at the big giant and took him down with just a simple little stone because we knew who was behind that stone, right? We knew where David's faith was. But the battle that pertains to our discussion today was a battle in which 4,000, 4, that's a big number, 4,000 Israelites lost their lives in one battle. 
Okay, we know there were a lot of Israelites, but that's a lot of Israelites to do lo- lose their lives. With sad, disillusioned hearts, the remaining Hebrew leaders, they gathered together trying to figure out what are we going to do? This is a lot of our good men all dead. What are we going to do? They felt defeated. They felt overwhelmed. They felt slaughtered by the Philistines of all people. And since they couldn't stand for this, they decided they had an idea. They had an idea. Hey, we have that Ark of the Covenant. You know, that that thing that's really powerful, that holds all of this victory within it, has a lot of strength. It's God's power, right? It's God's strength. It's God's superior over all things, which if God is superior over all things, then he's also superior over the Philistines, right? So why don't we just take out this ark? Let's go ahead and show these Philistine twerps who's actually boss, right? That's what they wanted to do. Let's just take this ark out, put it out there, and we'll show them who's boss. But in that moment, they weren't actually following God. They were still disobeying God because God is not a genie in the bottle, and that's exactly what they were using him as. They had their own wishes and their own desires. They wanted to destroy those Philistines, and they want to use this box to do that, right? They want to use God's power to do that. But God is no genie, and he is not going to be mocked. So the Israelites were still maintaining a posture of rebellion against God, and now they expected him to show up in strength on their behalf. And you got an idea of what happened? (laughs) In the rest of the story, we learn that the Israelites did bring out the Ark of the Covenant, they brought out the pretty box, and the Philistines, okay, they're there to battle them, and they battle them all right. And instead of 4,000 Israelites dying this time, 30,000 died this time. 30,000 men gone. Even more devastating, the Philistines actually took the Ark of the Covenant. They took it, not realizing the power that it had in it, by all means. They were shortly going to find out, (laughs) but they took it. That was devastating for the Israelites. The morning after, When they took the ark, they put it in their temple. Okay, this is in God's temple, inside their false God's temple named Dagon. Dagon. They returned to the temple to find, after they stuck that ark in there the next morning, that their statue, their large permanent statue of their God, was laying flat on his face as if he was bowing to the ark of God. They thought, well, that's just a fluke. No big deal, right? Stood him back up. The next morning... He's down again. But this time, this time his arms are broke off and his head is broke off. Now they were starting to get a little concerned, seemed a little fishy, what was going on. And before they knew it, all the people in their town had these sores from head to toe all over their body, all over their body. And then they saw rats running all over town, not just a couple, not just a couple, like swarms of them all over their city. Okay, so they finally are like, you know what? I don't really believe that this box has that much power, but um, I've kind of had enough of this. So they pass the box off to the next city, not back to the Israelites. No, just off to the next city, which <laughs> doesn't sound like that was very nice to do if that's what the box did to you. So you guess what happens to that city? They start to get sores all over their body. They have rats running all over their town. And this goes on for seven years, passing the box around and around and around and around. And all of this crazy stuff happens. So the Israel or the Philistines finally get frustrated and they say, you know what? We're giving it back to the Israelites. Let them have the sores and the rats. And as soon as they give the Ark of the Covenant back to the Israelites, their sores, sores start to heal. The rats start to run back into their wet, dark, damp holes, wherever they came from. And things start to get calm and much better. Israelites did not get the sores and rats either, by the way. What was true for the Israelites is so true for us here today. God created them in his own image. God created them for a purpose. God created them set apart for his glory and equipped them, equipped them for good work. He established a covenant arrangement with them, which really was for them, by the way. It wasn't just with them. This was to protect them, right? This was to give them provision. This was to provide for them and to satisfy their souls with a deep kind of fulfillment that they were not going to acquire anywhere else. This was not something that they could manufacture on their own. But there was an exchange, right? There was, you had to do something in exchange for all of that. Do you remember what that was? It's simple. Just need to let God be your God. 
there had to be a catch. I'm sure they thought that. Everybody thinks there has to be a catch. There has to be a catch. It can't be that good, right? We can't have all the fulfillment, all the satisfaction, all the contentment and joy and peace that you can stand, all the protection from awful circumstances and from mean-spirited enemies, all the provision and food and clothing we need. I mean, come on. They had manna, and you know what? I'm <laughs> I would have said the same thing. This is real food, God, right? So <laughs> they could have had all that they absolutely wanted, not to mention this captivating vision to devote themselves to a meaningful mission, unique gifts and talents, all the provision they could ask for. All they had to do was have a wholehearted yes. Yes, God, you are my God. Yes, God, you can pave my way. You can chart my course. You can meet my needs. And yet, yes is not what the Israelites said. Now, I'll tell you, they didn't actually say no either. They didn't say, no, God, you can't be our God. We want to be our own God. No, God, even though you just saved us from all of the slavery that we were in for 400 years and beaten and all the nastiness that we were there having, you can't pay their path. They didn't say you can't chart our course or, or meet our needs with that lovely manna. In response to God's offer to goodness and grace, provision and peace, the Israelites didn't say yes, but they didn't exactly say no either. Instead, they said maybe. Maybe. Do you ever say maybe to God? Anybody here ever say maybe to God? Be honest. Do you ever say maybe? You know, be clear. Some of us are an absolute, yes, God. We know we absolutely need you. I'm, I'm a sorry sort of God. I know I can't do that. I need you, God. We're right there. And then there's others of us who probably tell God, and some of you might hear do this as well. We say, God, no. I don't want you right now. I'm not even sure I believe you, right? I don't want you in my life. I don't want you to take care of that. But if I were a betting person, which I'm not, <laughs> but if I were, I would put my money on, in terms of how most of us respond to God, I would put my money on maybe. Maybe, God. And here's how I think it works. To God's lavish invitation of grace and purpose and acceptance and love and fulfillment, we say, wow, that's great. That's awesome, God. I'm all in. I'm all in. I'll take it. That is wonderful. But then moments later, just moments later, when something comes up that people who love God shouldn't want or shouldn't care to even have, we decide that we would be better off on our own and promptly revoke the power and authority that we just ever so greatly gave to God. The thing that we aren't meant to want is independence. However you define it doesn't matter. But the thing that we are not designed and meant to want is independence. It might look like meeting your need for clothing by over-shopping or overspending. It might look like meeting your need for community by people-pleasing or manipulation. It might look like meeting your need for success by steamrolling your colleagues and elbowing yourself all the way up the ladder of, of success. It might look like meeting your need for a romantic relationship by dating every Tom, Dick, and Harry that's out there. Independence means trying to meet God's needs, God's given needs that he's given you in ways that don't honor him one single bit. He gave us needs, the needs that we possess, but then he also promised to meet every single one of those needs. He's going to meet them in a superpower, supernatural, super consistent, super mind-blowing way to which we all say, uh, let me think on that. Right? Let me just think on that, God. But then we don't get back to it. We don't ever go back and think on it. Instead, until the moment when we're stuck in a real pickle, then we cry out to God, God, I need you, I need you. And we bring that fancy box back out. And we're like the genie in a bottle. God, can you come fix this? Now I want you. Can you come resolve this? Now I, I need you. Can you come just do your thing because you're God? Can you do it? I can't pay my bills. My parents found stuff they weren't supposed to find. My girlfriend says she's pregnant. My husband is threatening to leave. My teenager flunked again. The company is doing more layoffs. The IRS is after me. I hope that's not anybody's case here. But <laughs> Test results were positive. Whatever it is, the Philistines just slaughtered 30,000 more of us. Something trips our switch. And then and only then do we trot out that fancy box and ask God to take care of it. To which I wonder if God doesn't look and say, Maybe. <laughs> right? What does independence from God look like for you? What does your maybe look like? How does it show up in your life? We all have them. What is your maybe? Your friends, today God is inviting us into something more than just a maybe. 
Today, Jesus offers us a reset part. A heart reset. He is inviting us into a faith, a full blown, full powerful faith that is not out of your reach to have. I full heartedly, heartedly promise you it is not out of your reach to have. Jesus says, listen, this is how this is going to work. You come to me, you come to me, and then I'm going to come near to you. You first. He says, you first. Okay, you got to want this. You got to desire. He's already right there knocking on your door. He already wants this, but he's telling you, you've got to want this too. So you come first and then I will, I promise I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you and then I will bless you. You will be sealed forever for your good. Scripture says that this is called being grafted in by faith. Do you know what the requirement for us to be grafted in and to stay grafted in Jesus Christ is? Romans 11.23 says, do not persist in unbelief. That's it. That's it. All you got to do is believe. You got to come and you got to believe. Choose faith in Jesus. Draw near to him and then he will draw near to you. Let me tell you the rest of the story here of David. He's now an adult. He's now the leader of the Israelites. He's a writer of this 24, uh, 24th Psalm that we started out with today. But he also had plenty of maybe moments in his life. He had plenty of them that we can read about in the scriptures. One example would be his escapade with Bathsheba and her husband. If you don't know that story, look it up. You'll see how human David really was too. And yet when the history books were written, David was remembered as a man after God's own heart. How could somebody who messes up in such terrible ways even have somebody killed? How could they be a man after God's own heart? Because David asked for a reset heart. David asked for his faith to be reestablished in Acts 13, 22. Then we're told that he was a man after God's own heart. And let me say this as plainly as I can. If you are weary of running from God, if you are tired of going at this life alone, if you know there's something so much more to your purpose here on earth, you are absolutely right. You are 110% right, and you should be tired of running from God. If you're sick of the sores, if you're sick of the rats, if you're sick of the darkness that sin puts you in, then you are craving a reset. You're craving a reset. And the good news is, is that you can have that right here, right now. Before you leave today, before you even eat lunch today, you can have a reset heart. You know, over the last several years, just thinking about how many people who have had a reset heart, I can imagine it being thousands, right? Men, women, college students, even grade school kids, single moms, single dads, people who are cutters, people who are drug abusers, people who are so far from God and so fearful of this crazy world we live in have yet said yes to God. They didn't say no and they didn't say maybe. They said yes and you can too. So I want to look at three takeaways here that hopefully you remember, and this is one reason why I put the scripture in your bulletin today. So just look at the scripture in your bulletin if you would. Follow along with me here a little bit, and we're going to wrap this up. There's three benefits to a reset heart, from faith in self to faith in God. And David mentions every one of them here. He says, those with reset hearts reject impurity, okay? So when we draw near to God, when we ascend the mountain of the Lord, as Psalm 24.3 says, we are named among those who now have a clean heart, or clean hands, and a pure heart. The purity we have been longing for is Jesus. It's Jesus. We come to him, and we come to come close to him, and he begins to communicate his thoughts with us, starts to tell us his desires. We start to resemble him, and we begin to be transformed. We begin to be remade back to the way that we were meant to be made. So we draw near to God, right? And then he'll draw near to us and we're made pure. Those with reset hearts in Jesus, excuse me, the second benefit is those with reset heart, hearts trust in Jesus and trust only in Jesus. Look at the end of verse 4. At the end of verse 4 he says, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, okay? Anything can be your false God. Money can be your false God. Your stuff can be your false God. Your pastor can be your false God. Your husband can be your, pal your false God. Anything can be your false God. And he says, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God. So that means you're trusting in Jesus alone. <coughs> Excuse me. The thing that 
you may be trusting in, the thing that you may be putting your hope in, I can tell you right here, right now, that someday, some way, that thing is going to let you down. That thing is going to absolutely let you down. That thing is going to fall like the statue of Dagon at the feet of Jesus and going to say, I'm not worthy. And you know what the truth is? It's not worthy. It's not worthy of your faith at all, at all. Only Jesus is wor worthy of your faith. So lastly, the third benefit there that we see in that scripture is that those with reset hearts get to stand in God's holy place. That's the ascending on the mountain and get to be in God. It says, who is in God's holy place? Those with pure hearts and clean hands, right? We get to be in the presence of God. That's what it means to ascend the mountain of the Lord, to be in the presence of God. Do you understand what this means? Like, this is really cool. This is just fascinating to me and really cool. But we don't have to spend our days in desperate situations anymore. We don't have to spend our days in some depressed state or some fearful or sinful place. We can plant our lives in the presence of God. We can stand in the holy place all of our days, no alt or near to the ultimate um, power, near to the ultimate victory, near to ultimate love and grace we can stand firm despite however many winds or storms are coming around us we get to stand on Jesus Christ I'm gonna lead us here in a prayer before we end and if you are ready to reset your heart it can be in anything maybe it's in your relationship with Jesus maybe it's in your marriage maybe it's in your job maybe it's your attitude maybe it's your relationship with your children you can pray in your heart the words that I'm gonna pray out loud and have that reset it's as simple as that and then we can move forward with Jesus in this reset and that's why we're gonna talk about it for the next couple of weeks because I'm not just gonna let you have the reset and leave you hanging right we're gonna keep you moving along this progression to get closer to Jesus so you can say this prayer. This will be just between you and God. You don't need to say it out loud. Um, but you can say these words in your heart with me as I pray. So let's pray. Father, we are done coming up with our own rules for living. Our own strategies for success or our own coping mechanisms. Our path, our own paths to fulfill our never-ending <laughs> desires. We're done, God. We come to you asking you to receive us as you promise that you will. Cleanse us, purify us, strengthen us. Give us life that is truly life, the way that you designed it to be. We ask you to reorient us, Father, to remake us, to restore us, reset us here in this moment right now as we surrender. We are your children before our King, asking you to reset our hearts. Forgive us for running, forgive us for sinning, Forgive us for keeping you in a box. May we see with fresh vision your holiness, which beacons us to right living and real change. We hereby draw near to you, God. We want to be near to you, and we will wait for you to be then near to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.